Hey guys, and welcome to episode 160 of the OCDStories.com podcast. Now, this episode is called Your ERP Questions Answered, part two. And the reason for that is because I did a part one nearly two years ago with therapist um, and person with OCD, Sharla, nicely. And uh, for some reason, looking back now, I didn't give that episode a number. So I can't point you in the direction, but in the show notes of this episode, I will link to part one with Sharla nicely and Sharla kind of goes off, you know, what is ERP initially um, and then uh, starts to answer your questions. So for those that don't remember this over two years ago or two years ago, I I put out a questionnaire saying, you know, what ERP questions do you have? Um, loads of you put in so many um, so Sharla asked the first answer the first batch and now Dr. Joan Davidson is going to answer the second batch. So uh, thank you for being patient and for waiting. Um, it's definitely worth it. Joan gives some brilliant answers on ERP and answers your questions. So they're pretty much entirely this episode is made up of your questions as is part one. Um, so I do encourage you to go listen to part one with Sharla because obviously she goes into and sets up, you know, what is exposure and response prevention. Um, but just a quick summary, ERP or exposure and response prevention is a technique within cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. Um, and the reason why I, I titled the episode your ERP questions answered and not your CBT questions answered, because CBT is a therapy that has many tools and techniques within it. ERP is one of them and uh, a core part of OCD treatment is exposure and response prevention. So I wanted to focus on that. But with your CBT therapist, they probably will bring in other CBT techniques alongside ERP. However, the core of the treatment is usually based around exposure and response prevention therapy because that is what's got the most research and is proven to be effective. So uh, firstly, thank you to Joan Davidson for giving up her time and answering these questions. Um, I won't go into what we talk about, but it, it's very wide and varied, but all based around uh, your ERP questions. Um, but for those that haven't heard my episode I did with Joan, which was probably over two years ago, uh, she wrote the book, uh, Daring to Challenge OCD, Overcome Your Fear of Treatment and Take Control of Your Life Using ERP. So she was a natural fit for this uh, episode and to answer your ERP related questions. She is a licensed psychologist and co-director of the San Francisco Bay Area Center for Cognitive Therapy. Um, so yeah, for the first time I interviewed her, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So I was more than happy to get her back on again to answer these questions. So I won't waffle any more. Without further ado, here is Joan. In today's episode of the OCD Stories podcast, I have Dr. Joan Davidson. Joan is a licensed psychologist and co-director of the San Francisco Bay Area Center for Cognitive Therapy. She is also an assistant professor in the psychology department at the University of California, Berkeley, and the author of the book, Daring to Challenge OCD, Overcome Your Fear of Treatment and Take Control of Your Life Using ERP. Welcome back to the show, Joan. Thank you, Stu. It's a delight to be back. It's good to have you here, and I can't even remember when the, the first episode was. Do you remember how long? <laughs> well, what I remember is I was episode number 14. Oh, wow. I didn't realize it was that far back. So, yeah, it was far back, and congratulations on all these wonderful podcasts that you've done. I've listened to many of them, and congratulations on your award for doing this project too. No, I appreciate it. That means a lot. And uh, I'm only still doing them, A, because people listen, and B, because of people like yourself giving so generously of your time, which gave me encouragement and hope to kind of keep going. Um, Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. One of the things I really love about this is you combine uh, conversations with kind of leaders in the field of always treating OCD and ERP. So I find it fun as a clinician to hear, like to hear Reed Wilson speak again, or, and to hear other people, John Hirschfield, and you know, hear all the different clinicians speak. But then, as you know, um, what's so important to me is hearing people's stories and having so many folks on here who tell their story, what they've experienced, what they've gone through, how they found help, and their golden nuggets to offer others um, what is most helpful to them. Because for me, I find I'm learning the most at this stage of my game from people who've been there and really lived this and what was helpful to them and learning from their story. So it's a wonderful mixture 
thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no, I find that I learn a lot from people's stories, um, which I guess isn't a rare thing in, in psychology. Case studies have always been a go-to source of information for therapists and psychologists to learn. Um, and in a way, I guess these stories, people's stories are their own case studies that they're producing on the spot. Yeah, they're their own case studies. And what I really like about so many of these stories, what I try to do you know, in the book that I wrote, mm-hmm. is not just what is your story about how bad your OCD was, what form did it take, mm-hmm. Um, I mean, those are helpful to hear what people go through and come out of and, you know, how, how well they do. But to really hear how they approached ERP, you know, that they're, I like, I used a title in one of my talks where ERP isn't as cookie cutter as you may think. <laughs> Have these images that it, you go meet the, this therapist and it's going to be so rigid and it's all done one way. And as all of your podcasts show, we're still keeping to the fidelity of the model of what we're trying to achieve with exposure response prevention. But how we go about individualizing that for different people, where they're at, what's helpful to them, as long as we're going in the same direction, all the little details of how it works for one person or what helped them build the motivation or what imagery you know, is really useful for them, those are the, I think, the gold nuggets that other people can draw from in terms of how to do this treatment. Yeah. Yeah, a- absolutely. I can agree more. And we are here, obviously, to talk about ERP today. Um, and part one, so this is, uh, uh, but all every question I'm going to ask you is, bar kind of the last two, are entirely from the listeners. Um, and this is part two. Part one was with Sharla, a good friend of yours. Yes, uh, I, I listened to it a couple of times. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah. She's so, done some more since then too. She has, yeah, she has. Uh, so this is kind of answering the second lot of questions and maybe in the future I'll do more episodes answering, getting people to answer uh, people's ERP questions. So let's get into it. Um, the first question here from a listener is, how do you balance taking care of yourself with doing exposure, which will provoke a lot of anxious, upsetting feelings? I think that's one of the best questions of all. Hmm. Um, you know, it's easy to say we're going to do this ERP work and we're just going to somehow integrate this into your life. But the truth is life is stressful enough and you have so much you're trying to do in your life and then you're being bombarded with obsessions. And I talked to many folks about, you know, working with different anxiety disorders. I think OCD is just one of the more exhausting ones for people because, you know, like certain types of phobias or if you want to avoid certain types of situations that trigger your fears you can up to a point and then you might want to work on it because it's interfering with your life OCD the thoughts in your head can just pop up anywhere anytime a trigger can pop up you think you're in a safe place and then something pops up and you were just being bombarded with the threat response in your brain being triggered And I see for folks just how exhausting that is. And then, now we're gonna add in this ERP approach, which is intentionally going toward the obsession, the fear, the discomfort, instead of doing all that maneuvering to get out from under it, which actually in the end is probably less tiring, but initially more terrifying, because you get that spike um, in the fear, and we're trying to change uh, what your brain is learning, but now, that's another big challenge on top of all the other challenges. And then having to pick and choose, when am I going to do intentional practices? When can I fit that in and give myself enough time? Or how am I going to take on the spontaneous, or one of, one of my folks calls it, the pop-up exposures that just keep happening everywhere? It's exhausting. And so I think the self-care component is so critical when you're doing this work. And that might take many forms. I'm working with some folks where we've decided, can you talk to your boss, your employer, about starting to work part-time for this X amount of time? Because you need some time to do more exposure work, but you also need some downtime to do all those healthy, good things to take care of yourself. We want to focus on sleep, eating well, um, some calming times, maybe practicing some mindfulness, some meditation, stretching. What are some of the healthy self-care behaviors you can use to kind of help you through this time. I think Shala talks about that um, a lot, and I've spent time with Shala, and she's great at that. She'll take time out 
to do some self-care. And I've watched a lot of folks really benefit from what's the self-care plan. And I, in my progress notes, I'm always writing what's our self-care plan for that person. Maybe it's minimizing the amount of time they're running around doing certain things or getting some, someone to help them with pick up or drop off with their children if they can, to build in some time and space to do what is a good self-care um, exercise for them. It might be taking a walk, you know, it might be some just breathing, relaxation, um, calming times, whatever you need to do to help take good, good care of yourself so you can really maximize the likelihood of success in approaching these fears will help you so much. And you, you need that. And a lot of times people in your life might not appreciate how exhausting and terrifying this work is. When you go to bed at night, you've had to do these ERP practices on top of everything else. So I think, you know, working with a therapist or developing your plan yourself, sharing it with the people in your life, that this is really important, is really important. Yeah. yeah. It's a great, great question. Yeah, yeah. Good answer. Um, absolutely. And I know sometimes the, the term self-care can, can get I don't know what's the word lost in translation some people don't like it in the mental health community because it they feel when people talk about it they're trying to solve all their problems with it but it, it's such an important aspect to support the treatment because um, if you're not looking after yourself it's, it's going to be hard to do the work you need to do to, yeah you know. exactly and that's that's really interesting how different people might respond to self-care that mm. concept it's kind of like how I people, how I hear people respond to self-compassion. They have all sorts of automatic thoughts about what that means. You know, I've had some people, I'm here on the West Coast in San Francisco Bay Area, and if I had a, you know, nickel for every time I heard someone from the East Coast, where I'm from, I'm from back there, I get it. Oh, I'm not doing that kind of stuff. That's all too California for me, you know. <laughs> I, I'm from the East Coast, or I do, you know. Like, well, wait a minute, let's think about your automatic thoughts or how are you defining self-care? Because sometimes people think that's just selfishness or this kind of too soft, yeah. take care of ourselves, be a yogi kind of thing. And so I think it's really working with everybody to see what does that mean for you? How can we build in time that you're taking good care of you? And sometimes that does mean as a therapist, we're helping them with their automatic thoughts that care for themselves is not okay. You know, I got to take care of my children. I got to take care of my husband. I got to take care of work. I got to take care of all these things. And I'll do the ERP. And then it doesn't go so well. <laughs> you're exhausted. You can't truly practice leaning in and, you know, getting the new learning if you're just kind of running 100 miles an hour. So really taking a look at what's getting in the way, if that's, that's a problem. And what self-care might mean. It might mean just a little tweak of something for someone. Or for someone else, it might be making a change in their schedule at work to allow for more time to get some exercise, fresh air, um, and some meditation in. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Okay, so next question then is, is it common in ARP to feel worse before you get better? Yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm thinking about some of the people who've been on podcasts before me will come out and say it, I'll come and say, that's the goal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's what we want, right? Um, you want to bring, as you've heard everybody else talk about, you want to bring on the obsession and the fear that goes with that so that you can get the new learning. You can have an experiential um, component to learning something new to work with that. So you know, people come in sometimes with, oh, I didn't have much anxiety this week, or they come in with a measure that shows practically nothing. And I usually will say something provocative like, that's too bad. You must have been avoiding a lot. And they're like, well, yeah, that's why I had a better week. <laughs> and so, yeah, and then where is that getting you in your life and the avoidance and how is that taking over your life? So it's really building, and you've heard others speak about this, the willingness to really go toward the fear, go toward what feels so hard and uncomfortable, and it will. It'll initially spike up probably, but it's in the service of creating that new learning and learning to ride that out and you can start to habituate but most importantly you're learning that you can handle it and you can ride out the discomfort and by getting there we eventually will feel better and better and better but initially it is a willingness to go toward the very things you've been giving it your all and maybe for years or decades 
to avoid. So there's initial, an initial spike where things feel worse, and, but over time, we're working toward getting to a better and better place. I've also heard many people say, you know, yeah, it feels worse very, very initially, but you know what? It works, and then I start coming down from this, and the other way took so much longer. I don't, I'm not sure which one's worse. Actually, I, I think I'm going to go toward leaning in toward it because I get out of it sooner. So even though it might feel that initial spike, if people start to get that new learning pretty quickly, they realize the other way I was spending the next day or two, like trying to avoid or undo or do these rituals. And I felt badly for so long. This way was pretty tough, but, you know, it didn't last as long. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. I've never looked at it that way. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's kind of that doing ERP is maybe slightly worse feeling, but for a very short duration of time, and usually you then feel better quicker. Whereas, like you said, you could do compulsions like a day and a half trying to get rid of this obsession, and maybe you achieve it, but you've just suffered for a day and a half, whereas the ERP, may, the exposure may have only taken you uh, 45 minutes to start to habituate or get that new learning. Yeah, it's interesting. I've heard more and more people give me that feedback. Once they really get this work, you know, you got to be careful, right? In the beginning, oh, if you're used to, like, I'm going to lean in and do it because I want this to end really fast, mm -hmm. it's going to be there. <laughs> you have to really be willing to embrace the fear, the uncertainty. And then when you do that and you start to realize, okay, I can do that, um, people then start to say, I think I'm going to choose that because, oh, God, I don't want to have to go home. And they have that thought. I noticed the wording. I need to do these rituals, but like you need, hmm. you're choosing. Oh, right. My brain's telling me I need to do all these rituals. I can make a different choice. And then you start experimenting with that different choice. And uh, sometimes it does, you realize, ooh, this is actually the path I really want to choose. But to answer the, the person's question, yeah, it's very common for it to feel worse because you're going against what your brain has been feeding you, this message of threat. And you've been reinforcing that everything is threatening and it feels like life or death. And here we are going to start practicing going toward that feeling and not engaging in all those behaviors and rituals or avoidance to get out from under it. So we're really bringing that intensity up and going in toward it and with it. And it can be very painful and it can feel worse. Obviously, that can feel worse. And then the more you're practicing, you're feeling worse a lot because you're not trying to avoid but, you know, again, that's going to help you get to a place where you look at the bigger picture and notice that you're getting out from under it in a different way by accepting and leaning in and having new tools. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, I always warn. I think it's even in our treatment agreement <laughs> with folks <laughs> just warning people, yeah, you may feel worse before you get better because this work is about going toward the fears, not getting a quick fix, getting out from under it. Let me give you these magic words and you won't have to feel it. Yeah. We're going to find a whole new response to what, sca what scares your brain. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Should, should I read you my, um, my yeah, little um, yeah. in the below thing, if that's helpful here? Yeah. So one of the th when I was thinking about this podcast, I was thinking about creativity, which is something that I'm spending a lot of time in workshops talking about how do we creatively individualize treatment for people. And I just, this book crossed my my desk and by this wonderful guy, many of you may know, Ken Goodman. Ken Goodman is an anxiety specialist. He's at the ADAA, Present Anxiety and Depression Association of America, sometimes at the IOCDF, presenting a lot. And he did, he wrote this coloring book. It's a coloring book that goes with all of the, you know, the wisdom of how to face anxiety. And one of the ones, I read this to most of the people I work with, and I'll just kind of cut to the chase. He has in here, uh, one of the people he worked with wrote this little chapter called, you know, her personal journey. And she basically says this, Ken told me, your job is not to be comfortable. Your job is to live your life. I approached my healing like a buffalo rather than a cow. Okay. According to Native American lore, when a storm approaches, buffaloes turn toward the storm and ran into it, which helped them get through it faster. Cows, on the other hand, ran away from the storm. 
This meant that the storm was at their backs, chasing them until it finally caught them, which made the ordeal last longer. I learned how to accept my discomfort rather than fight it. I also faced life like the buffalo, even when I wasn't sure I could. What I discovered surprised me. When I accepted my symptoms, they dissipated. So I use this with many folks, and we kind of go, okay, am I going to be the cow or the buffalo? And the buffalo, you go right toward what's so uncomfortable, but that's the process that gets you through. Okay. Or you can just keep prolonging it by running away from it, but it catches up in different ways. So that's helpful to folks. Yeah. Ken, Good, Ken, Ken has wonderful pearls of wisdom um, in his book. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. Um, that uh, yeah, that metaphor. Um, and Goodman is he? He's not behind the Y box, is he? Is no. He? no, no, I don't believe so. Uh, no, I think there was a good a Goodman involved in the Y box. But... Yeah, Ken Goodman. Um, so this is his break free from anxiety, and he has another like again. I just when I find something really helpful, I try to share it with my patients. But along this idea, he has this little graph of the choice point. And you, you can see, but the choice point is if you're dealing with anxiety and uncertainty, which we've got in OCD, if you take the choice that's comfortable and certain, the one that's going to feel better right away, you keep circling back to the land of misery and around and around you go. And if at that choice point you choose the path that is uncomfortable and uncertain, feeling worse before you feel better, this is what helps you branch out to the land of freedom. So if you're in an anxiety threat mode response with OCD, if you're going down the uncomfortable and uncertain path, you're probably going in the right direction. So that's going to feel worse yeah. <laughs> initially. But that's, you know, you see the greater gain for choosing that. Yeah. So just to let that person know, yeah, you know, you probably will feel worse before it gets better. But can you feel really, I try to help people, can you feel really good about yourself for being so courageous and finding the courage within you to face the things that are really hard rather than run from them. And that probably will, we have to go through something that's more painful initially to get to that better place. And that's the reward. And it makes it easier, I hope, to go towards feeling more uncomfortable before you feel better. Yeah, really good way to put it. And uh, a great way to start this, this episode on ARP is to kind of set up that, that point of view. Um, so next question is, and I've, I've heard this a few times is when does ERP become a compulsion? Yeah, that's a tricky one, huh? Mm. I wish we had a specific example. I know it's quite, yeah. Yeah, it could be many things. Um, often, so I don't, I'm not sure exactly what, what they're asking, yeah. but I've seen some people, like I talk about the perfectionism, wanting to do things just right, just so and uncertainty and the feeling of responsibility, start applying that to their treatment, which makes perfect sense, right? You apply that to various things in your life that matter to you, it comes up in treatment too. And then it becomes, I have to do my ERP, I have to do my ERP, I have to do my ERP, and it becomes, if I don't do my ERP, if I don't do it just right, if I don't do it every time, if I don't do it perfectly every time, I'm not gonna be responsible, I'm never gonna get better, and all these catastrophic thoughts, that might be, when ERP starts to become its own compulsion of, uh-oh, was that an intrusive thought? Is that something I need to lean into? Is that something I need to do response prevention around? And then you're chasing it everywhere. Because then the fear, the obsession becomes like, if I don't do ERP or get it right every single time, I will never get better. My life will be miserable. You know, would those be the feared consequences? And then what's the compulsion? The compulsion is, so I have to keep doing ERP or else. So that would be one form, I guess, that it could take, because we're always looking at trying to identify what's the obsession, what's the fear, the core feared consequence, and what's the compulsion, you know, to get out from under that fear and obsession. Mm. So I guess ERP could start to be approached that way. And then we would try to like mix it up and be more flexible or do some scripts around maybe I don't get all my ERP done or I don't handle every single one or I kind of blew the, you know, we'd look for creative ways hmm. to not have to do it all perfectly or else or do scenarios that maybe you don't get your ERP done perfectly and you didn't do it every single time 
or maybe I'd have to think this through of when do we not do a certain ERP exercise to uh, mix it up yeah. and, and work with that obsession and leaning into that fear if that's what it is. Now, I've had other folks where the, the question might be more, when does the response I come up with uh, to the obsession become its own new compulsion. <laughs> so, and it's tricky stuff because, okay, I'm going to accept, I don't know. I'm going to say, I don't know uncertainty. And I lean toward that, that if your brain is clever and tricky enough and that OCD tricky brain can be, then by saying, I don't know, or I accept the uncertainty that becomes its new compulsion. Mm. Right. Then yeah. I have to, I have to say those words. I have to do certain things that are supposed to be response prevention, but those response prevention things now become a new propulsion. So, I mean, the OCD brain is tricky. Yeah. And so we're looking for that. Or I've often had people in the beginning, if, if certain numbers are bad, then I'm going to try to land on other numbers just to or land on the bad number to tolerate that. And then next thing you know, I always have to land on that number. Then, then we have a new rigid rule about different numbers because that was your response prevention to mix it up but now it's become about this one so i think i'm not sure exactly what the person writing in was referring to but i think it's a great question to pay attention to and for us as therapists to pay attention to when might a compulsion start to develop its own new obsession around engaging in that compulsion or when thoughts about doing erp start to become a new obsession about always having to do ERP or if I don't do it right or just so. So I don't know if I'm answering exactly no, what this person was asking. I think you are, yeah. Yeah, like you said, without context, it, it could be anything. But um, then that was a good point. Um, and yeah, it's fun for the therapist to kind of be on high alert for. Um, okay, so next question is... Because, oh, you know, OCD is so tricky. It is, yeah. We're really good at this. Sometimes they'll say two years later, oh my goodness, and now I'm realizing... I mean, I turned that into, you know, that was uh, an obsession or that became a new compulsion. Oh, my goodness. So it's an, your brain is tricky. Yeah. And so you keep trying to be a little trickier and aware and mix it up when we think we're getting stuck. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good point. Okay, so next one is around health worries. So are, are there any tips to how I can use ERP for health worries? Um, I've managed to overcome some of the smaller OCD fears in my life my health OCD and fear of having a deadly illness prevails. Yeah, well, any tips, really the answer is always in approach it the same way you would approach any other mm -hmm. obsession, right? Is Reed Wilson, uh, I just have such great images in my mind of Reed Wilson at any conference. He'll get up there and just kind of yell at the audience and go, it's not about the content. It's not about the content, right? And I've heard him and others talk here beautifully about being careful not to get caught in this content. Well, this content is different. This one really matters. Or this content. Now, that one is so much more important. I think what there's, this person is saying is like, you know, I was able to practice ERP for many other obsessions, but this is the hardest one for me. You know, most people have some that are just, this is the one. Hmm. This is the one that gets me. This is the really hard one. And of course, the answer is we're going to try to approach it in the same way. What's the obsession? What's the feared consequence? What are we leaning into and practicing acceptance of uncertainty about so that we can change our responses and facilitate new learning right? um, and change the expectancies? So I think with the health anxiety, it is a really hard one for people because many obsessions on some level, people know there's something really off about their thinking, but it feels so real that they're really going to be a pedophile or murder someone. They kind of know or that this their degree of response to contamination is not in line with everybody else's. They're somewhat aware, but it feels so real they can't help responding. Mm. Health anxiety, people will say, yeah, but, yes, but, I could have a deadly illness. I could, this mark on my skin, this could be a sign of melanoma. Um, this palpitation in my heart could be a sign that I'm having a heart attack or you name it, right? We all um, probably face, as we get older, 
each day has new challenges of something we're feeling. And uh, I think as we get older, it's like, oh, yeah, this and this. We feel this pain, that pain. My eyes do something weird here. Hey, I didn't see that um, speck on my skin before. And then there's that hypervigilance because what's the fear? So if we think about the mechanisms, uncertainty as to whether or not I'm going to have this deadly illness, I want to get that sense of reassurance and comfort that it's okay, and the responsibility and threat theme that is threatening, and somehow I have to take responsibility or else, right? Like if I don't get this checked out or if I don't do all the right things, if I don't take responsibility, then I will have this deadly illness and it's my fault. I've got to be responsible. And of course, that could lead us to going to the doctor every day. <laughs> it could lead us to getting CT scans, MRI scans, and asking doctors, no, 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 I really want you to check this out. And then we get ourselves in a really, really bad pattern. But the core fear is, yeah, but maybe this one is real. And how do you know? You know, they'll ask me, how do you know? You're not a doctor, doctor, you're a psychologist. You don't know if this is what I really have that could be a concern. And that's what's so activating because what are we taught? We're taught to make sure we go to our doctor. If we have symptoms, go and check them out. Early preventative care is the best. Now with the OCD brain, that's just like, oh, I better go check it out. I better go check it out. So what I try to talk to people about is, well, when are we separating out just kind of the common health concerns that we all might have versus when we're in more of the threat mode response, right? Because OCD is the threat part of the brain, not thinking rationally, right? It's not rational, you know, cognitive distortions. Let's look at the evidence and all that. No, it's not that part of the brain. It's in threat mode. And so I'll usually ask the question about frequency, intensity, and urgency. How frequently are these thoughts circling around? Like, I can't stop thinking about it. It's constantly circling. How intense, you know, that sud scale kind of thing. Is it just, oh, okay, I better go get this checked out at the doctor. Like, oh my God, this is so scary. And an urgency. I got to get the answer right away or I can't tolerate not knowing. I can't tolerate it. I, I have to get it. So if we have the frequency, intensity, and urgency going on, I say, whoop, what do you think is probably going on here? And then we have the willingness to try to approach this as a possible obsession and compulsion. Hmm. And then, you know, we're looking at, we're always taking risks. Um, we don't want to just err completely in the direction of never check something out, but can I tolerate this feeling of not knowing for certain um, and not re getting my reassurance and getting on the internet and looking up something. Because what happens every time you start looking up something on WebMD or something, it's worse and worse and worse. So we can set up some step-by-step, -step, minimizing the amount of time looking things up, the amount of time before you go to, it's like maybe we don't need to go to the emergency room, but we can space out the time to, to check something out with the doctor or set up a plan that helps develop that new learning around when I get activated like this, can I accept the uncertainty and that maybe I'm not doing the absolute right thing, but advantages, disadvantages for always responding this way versus living my life. And that's where I come into all the values and all. And then when we get into more of our calmer, wise mind that can think after we've had time to sit with the distress and discomfort of not responding with urgency, you know, then we often can make decent choices. And, you know, sometimes I know it's a tricky, it feels like a tricky call, but really I think this is turning black. Okay, well then maybe that is something we do want to get checked out, but how can we go about doing this in a, a good way that's not feeding the obsession and urgency of a reaction that is a compulsion? Yeah. 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 That's, that's so, giving us concrete advice or not but yeah no, that's really good it's a really thought out answer and you've kind of you factored in many variables um well a, a question i always like to that i think is a good one to ask is what kind of why am i why do i want to do this action action being either actually an action or a compulsion do i do it because i actually care about the person i'm worrying about or do i do it because i generally think i've got some virus on my hands i'm trying to give various obsession examples or mm -hmm. am i doing it because i want to lower my anxiety exactly that's excellent yeah. 
I like your answer the best. Yeah, if you check in with yourself, what's driving this behavior, this urgency and needing to engage in this behavior? And people are usually pretty good when you step back, kind of that meta level. Is this really about the content that I got to get something checked out? Or is it about the sense of urgency and I've got to get out from the discomfort and that's what this is all about? People are usually pretty good at saying, okay, yeah, it's about this. You know, it's the urgency and the desperation. I need to have an answer and I have to get rid of my anxiety. And I said, why don't we then choose, do you want to choose, to experiment with accepting that maybe, you know, that let's work on accepting the maybes, but not engaging in all these behaviors that are training your brain to just think emergency, emergency, emergency. Um, you know, and then maybe we can reevaluate. Because yeah. most of the time, I, mean, I love the expression of somebody taught me, one of my patients, I guess they teach this with kids, is anyone's hair on fire? Is anyone dying right now? <laughs> if not, you know, and then we can determine. And sometimes there are questions, like if there is something to be checked out or not. But then we can approach this from a more calm uh, mind that's not coming from anything to get rid of the anxiety and get out from, from, out from under the anxiety. Mm-hmm. But we can step back and really look at, is there something here that maybe should be checked out? Or sometimes, I know this is really tricky territory, um, asking somebody, because that becomes reassurance seeking, right? Mm. But I think in health anxiety and some others, sometimes we really don't know. You know, sometimes we really don't know. If, If a bat scraped up against me, do I need to go in and see the doctor? Yeah, you might. <laughs> um, you know, if certain things happen, like we had this on our listserv, a local listserv, uh, one time with a therapist asking. And all the therapists said, no, 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 that's real. <laughs> and so sometimes when it's really not clear, we want to treat everything like OCD and tolerate it. And, but every now and then there might be something you're like, okay, but, but we don't want to respond with urgency to get just rid of the anxiety. But once we can tolerate, we're going to be uncertain. We're not going to get this solution immediately. Um, we got to ride this out, and then there might be something now. And then it's like, yeah, this one might be worth checking with the doctor about. But we're coming from that calmer thinking brain, yeah. You know, and if it's your pattern, you're more likely to say, okay, that's me freaking out about another thing and another thing and another thing. And I remember just a very wise doctor I had said, look, if a symptom goes away in a few days, we're not worried. Yeah, if it stays a long, long time, come on in, we'll check it out. You know, so most of the time. We don't need to get in there urgently. So and if you know that my pattern is to respond with all this urgency and I got to get it resolved right away or else I can't tolerate the anxiety, let's go after that, not the content. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a message I drum home a lot. It's not about the content, as Reed says. It's not about the content. It's, it's never about the content. Yeah. It's the content is just used for the practice of accepting an uncertainty about something and choosing to be willing to bring it on and that meta level of thinking of, mm. I want that so my brain can get new learning. Yeah. But it's not about debating the content itself. Yeah, you know? absolutely. That's OCD's game. Um, yes, you're right. Okay, cool. So next question then is around sleep. So how can I resist, and I guess they mean the compulsion here, so how can I resist when the feared consequence is not sleeping and all the rituals are at bedtime. Kind of the answer is right there, isn't it? <laughs> uh, the core, the fear is if I don't engage in these compulsions, I won't be able to sleep. Yeah. So how would we treat that no matter what time of day that was? We're going to go toward maybe I won't sleep. Right? Maybe I won't be able to sleep. And we might choose to reduce rituals if it's too much to just stop them all at once. But reduce rituals, but with the acceptance of, and maybe I will sleep, maybe I won't sleep. I don't know. Because anytime we want to change, take away that ritual, we're leaning toward the uncertainty. So, I mean, what that question implies is, well, I don't want to do this ERP practice close to bedtime because then that makes it worse that I really might not sleep. Well, that's what we want to go after. Maybe you won't sleep. Maybe you won't get and would get at the what's their core fear. Is it that you won't sleep enough to be able to function well tomorrow? Will this pattern continue day after day? Will you become so sleep deprived that you just can't do anything or you get seriously depressed and 
end up in a hospital or like what what are all the fears of not being able to sleep unless you could do imaginal exposures too if i don't do all these rituals i am i'm going to tolerate the discomfort that comes with the obsession i might not be able to sleep very much like what we do with people with sleep problems they have so many worries about not being able to sleep that they can't sleep because they're worried about the consequences of not being able to sleep so we accept not sleeping maybe we're not going to sleep maybe maybe not and so if the rituals are before bedtime, well, that brings it right up to like a really good practice in a way, because it's right there. If I don't do this and this and this, maybe I won't sleep. That's what we got to lean into and accept. It sounds like you might be looking for a way around it because I want to make sure I get a good night's sleep. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's great to get a good night's sleep. That's good, healthy self-care. But if part of our worries or obsessions are about, I need to get sleep or else, these um, devastating consequences, and it's frequently going through our minds, and we have all this intensity and urgency to make sure I do everything I can so I can get a good night's sleep, then we want to challenge that. Lean in and go towards accepting maybe I won't get a good night's sleep. You might do the feared case scenarios of not getting a good night's sleep. Start changing the rituals, which you can do gradually, or you know you can speed them up a little. So I don't know if there's a magic answer in there other than we got to go toward it. Absolutely. And that, that the, the buffalo metaphor comes back in for me here, which is um, the kind of, yeah, if you, if you face it and you do the ERP, you may have two days, you may have two weeks of terrible sleep, but the chances are after those, say, two weeks, you're going to have a lot better sleep. Or you can keep avoiding it and have okay sleep to bad sleep for the next three years, you know. Right. And of course, we don't really know no. it's going to go. Like if you do some exposures to I'm not going to be able to sleep. And if I don't sleep, then I'm going you know, this horrible thing is going to happen. And if you get more and more used to that, and the brain isn't as threatened by that. Then it just becomes a little bit more of a boring kind of oh, not so great story. Then you might be getting such a better night's sleep. You know, the paradox of this work, yeah. um, working with sleep problems is you go for the sleep deprivation and you get new learning. Yeah. So. You don't know which way it's, you know, if you can really work on eliminating the rituals and accepting, I don't know, maybe I, maybe I won't get a good night's sleep. I'm not going to fall asleep. You know, and you go with that uh, paradox of that. It'd be interesting to see. You might find that you do sleep better. Then you spend your time lying there with these mental obsessions about did I do all the right things? What if I don't get enough sleep? And if you're doing that while you're trying to go to sleep, you're not going to sleep well. If you practice acceptance that you won't get a good night's sleep and I'm going to be okay with that, I'm going to, you might get a better night's sleep. But you have to be able to be willing to not get a good night's sleep. Yeah, good way of putting that. Um, okay, so next question is how would you, so it, it's quite long, but I want to read it because of the context. So how would you apply ERP to being constantly aware of your breath 24-7? Uh, I constantly feel I have to take deep breaths in all day, which causes anxiety because that's what my whole day seems to consist of. Some days are better than others, but it's one compulsion I can't seem to beat. Have you ever treated someone with compulsions around breathing? Oh, that's such a great question. And these, it's one of those sensory um, yeah, obsessions, yeah. sensory motor obsessions. And to be honest, no, I haven't mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reason. Um, but I have worked with people with other sensory motor um, obsessions like the, how is my tongue moving or aware, so hyper awareness around your tongue or mouth movement. Um, so what I know is from what I've learned and I also am in a consultation group with all my partners at our center and other folks do work. You know, if this is the obsession that comes up, we talk with each other to help each other with that. So my understanding, uh, again, I haven't had the direct experience myself, but how would I approach it? Get some consultation while I'm doing it, since it is uh, a little bit uh, different than ones I have uh, worked with. But we're still going for the same thing, right? So there's an overfocus, and I think they said it well, like this hypervigilance on the breath and how am I breathing? And then usually with that overfocus, that's the obsession, and we get focused on the breathing, we want to look at what's the fear What's the core fear and what's the compulsion? So typically the core fear is I won't be able to stop thinking about this. I won't be able to stop being so vigilant about this. This is going to take up my whole day. Maybe this will never go away. 
This will become my whole life. I'll never get back to unconscious breathing without noticing it again. So you get so fearful of that. And of course, the more you fear it, the more you notice it, the more you focus on it. And then the compulsion typically is try to distract, look somewhere else, don't focus on your breath, go somewhere else. Like, so then we would look at, okay, if, what's the obsession is focusing on the breath. And the fear would be, I'll never be able to stop focusing on the breath. I need to be able to focus on other things. So it'll, I need it to become more of an unconscious breath. And then they're hypervigilance. They keep checking in on their breath. They want reassurance, right? That's all that compassion, reassurance, seeking, checking on their breath. And now it just keeps feeding this big cycle. And what we want to do is, and not, and they're trying to then look away to get rid of it, right? So then, but I, my understanding would be, let's do some intentional practices focusing on the breath. <laughs> let's go toward it. Instead of keep trying to like, oh, all the maneuvering people do with an obsession is to get out from under it, get all the, you know, how am I going to reassure myself? How am I going to look away and do other things? Is to set up times to intentionally go toward noticing your breath and not engaging in all this maneuvering to get out from under it. And then it doesn't become such a feared um, experience. Yeah. It just yeah. becomes something we can, the brain is learning to accept rather than keep running away from or fear or engaging in all of those um, maneuvers around it. And I think here you could also do imaginal exposures to what if I you never stop focusing on my breath? You know, how bad would that be? How do I know if I'll never stop? You know, the uncertainty is usually where you want to go. So I think you could do imaginal exposures to getting stuck on focusing on the breath and then what would happen and what would happen and the uncertainty that maybe I'll keep coming back and focusing on my breath throughout life. But we want to start getting more accustomed to that rather than fearing it and we got to get out from under it. And I believe that, you know, folks I know would do some more intentional exposures. Let's focus on that breath. Let's go toward it. Just like any other obsession, right? We're going toward it. The buffalo going toward the storm. Maybe I did hit somebody. Maybe I could be a pedophile. Maybe I am contaminated. You know, focusing on the breath. Maybe I'll always focus on my breath. I don't know. It's uncertainty. Let's focus on it. Just like we'll focus on any other obsession. So that's my understanding of um, how people do work with that. But again, I would consult with somebody, for if, if a person's really struggling with this, someone who has had experience doing these exposures. Yeah. So at least consult with folks who yeah. you know, feel most comfortable when I'm, I'm in the realm of, oh, yeah, I've done all of this before. Or I've done things so similar to this. I got it. <laughs> and every now and then something will come up, but I've got great colleagues to consult with. We did that with the mouth mm. and tongue and just let's go focus with it. And maybe you'll always focus. And, and then it kind of just went away. That one kind of came and went pretty quickly. Mm. You know, thanks. Thanks for answering that one. And uh, yeah, to 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 risk reassuring the person who answered the question. I've actually met someone before with that exact compulsion. Um, okay. Sort of taking the deep breaths constantly throughout the day. To, to, I can't remember why this person was doing it, um, what the what the fear was, but I, I remember hearing the compulsion quite, quite a lot. Um, it's a very it's right. visible compulsion. <laughs> right, right, it can be. Yeah. Uh, or it can be so, more subtle that they're so focused on their breath and you know, we're not noticing it, but then we look at what's the fear hmm. and the overfocus is on the fear. Maybe it's, I'm not going to be able to get a full breath. I think it's something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So then we got to lean into that and mm -hmm. try to change the compulsion Yeah. to get some new learning that maybe, maybe I won't breathe. Well, maybe I'm not breathing really well. I don't know. That's my uncertainty and doubt. I don't know. And try to work on not going, <gasps> if this is your comfort and reassurance that you're getting you know, again, you tweak it for everybody individually based on what's their obsession, their core fear, and what compulsion are they engaging in that's reinforcing that yeah. so that we can figure out. And that's why I think this requires a lot of creativity, this work. It's not just a cookie cutter, you know, for everybody. It depends on what the core fear is, um, which one, what's an obsession and what's a compulsion. Sometimes it's tricky to figure out. Uh, but once we go, there's the obsession, there's the core fear, there's the compulsion, then we know what we got to go after. And then we can get creative about trying to change the way of responding and either bringing it on, yep, choosing to bring it on, and 
for changing those responses that just keep feeding this, the loop. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Yeah, no, really good answer. Um, so next question is a slight, uh, not detour, but a different, different angle, or maybe more of a political question. But um, <laughs> the, the, oh. <laughs> they want to know, um, it seems to me that acceptance and commitment therapy is more effective than exposure and response prevention therapy for, for pure row. Um, is this a common feeling? So for those, just some background context, I won't go into differences, or maybe let you do that between ACT and ARP, but uh, pure own being there are compulsions, but they are more mental usually uh, sort of in your head as opposed to in the physical world like door checking or hand washing. Um, right. Yeah, what, what are your thoughts on that? Oh my gosh, that's loaded on so many levels, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the puro exactly. You know, I was learning more about this. I was watching an interview with Dr. Philipson. Yep. I think, um, and I believe he's the one who coined the term puro. He did, yeah. Some decades ago. Late eighties, yeah. Yeah, and it made good sense at the time yeah. because at the time people were noticing outward compulsions, these kind of behaviors that look so odd and trying to understand what was going on with that, and then people were like, oh, that's OCD. So washing compulsions and you know, checking compulsion. So people saw OCD as you get these intrusive obsessive thoughts and you engage in these rituals or behaviors um, and that's to undo it. But there's a whole huge segment of people who were suffering from OCD that weren't being treated or getting the acknowledgement or were people really seeing that at one point is OCD. And um, Ted, who's in my book, one of his stories, is in my book and he was a he's in his 80s so this you know he was suffering from childhood and then he was in the priesthood and then he started learning more about this thing called OCD when it finally started becoming something we were learning about and one person was doing research and he managed to get into her office on campus and say please can you point me to someone who can help me and it's the famous um, famous name in the, the work with OCD back then and he said, I think I scared her. You know, she, I got out of the office and she didn't want me coming back. Because <laughs> um, she didn't know what to do because his were mental compulsions. There were no outward behavioral compulsions. And this didn't fit with the research they were doing at the time. So people like Ted were really suffering. And then people started understanding more mental compulsions were happening, you just couldn't see them. So I think, you know, that term pure O helped people identify, oh, I'm one of those people who suffers the same thing, but you just don't see my compulsions. And of course now, you know, there's a movement towards, you know, let's be careful about using that because the implication is I just have obsessions and no compulsions. And the truth is mental compulsions, those can be some of the hardest ones to deal with because you don't have the physical manifestation. Things are just going through your mind. So there's a mental checking mental sometimes retracing your steps what did i do did i get the laundry detergent in did i really put the laundry detergent in did i really understand what that person said or mentally undoing something if i say it this way three times or pray it this way so there's so many mental compulsions that are serving the same function and people people suffer greatly because it's all hap you're carrying it around up here in your head and it's so hard to notice it sometimes so that you can interrupt it versus if you're you know, tapping a certain number of times, you're pretty aware of it. So I think that's such a, it's such a um, important, it's such an important uh, focus in the work we do is to help people catch their mental compulsions and be able to work with them differently. Now, the next part of the question, this whole ACT versus ERP, I'll probably say something that will get me in trouble, maybe. I don't know. Um, yeah. I, I honestly don't see what all the fuss is about because they blend together so well. Yeah. And when, yeah, I hear different people. I go to, I've been to ACT workshops. You know, I've got these, everybody wants to, pit, and I've been to other ones where they want to pit ACT versus ERP. It's like, it's this or this. And, you know, am I following the Hexaflex formulation? It's like, what are we actually trying to do? And I forget his name, but there was someone at an ACT workshop and I went to on how to use ACT with OCD and ERP. And to me, this just was brilliant and it made complete sense to me. Michael Tuhigg? Maybe. Maybe. Canadian. What, 
talked about bringing, um, like when you think of, they have a, a formulation with a, a hexaflex, right? And so the, to use mindfulness and build willingness to take committed actions that are in line with the values so you can live a valued life. Yeah. It's great. I, I mean, ACT is terrific. And what he did is he said ERP is in the committed behavior section. So we're building the willingness to choose to take an action that's difficult. And we're going to tolerate and notice we're going to feel that. But it's in line with our greater goals and value or values and goals. And like, so he wove ERP right into how that all works within the ACT model. And then he would and he said clearly, um, of course, I don't know if that was him or not. So I, don't, I want to be careful. I don't want to quote the wrong person. He goes, you have to do ERP. That is what we have to do. Where can ACT come in with that or supplement that or add to that? How can we work? And so what I find is some of the greatest work from ACT is really paying attention to what do I value so I can live a truly committed life. And when working with people with ERP, this is the hook. And when, I, when people can really tell me, they, we work on what do I value more than certainty and being reassured or whatever that is, I value this more. And we're really committed to that. Then I'm always, like you've heard me talk before, in the exposure, I'm always, every single time, when people are like, Joan, I'm like, say it again. <laughs> Why are you doing this? Yeah. What's important enough to you to ride out the discomfort of this feeling? And so I find that ACT, those components of ACT, building the motivation and building the willingness and for the greater values and living the life I want to live has helped me tremendously take ERP to the real personal level outside in your life. Choice points all day long. I want to choose the life I want to live rather than be at the mercy of needing this certainty and whatnot. So that's how I think ACT and ERP can blend beautifully together. And I don't know if they need to be an either or. But then the question in there was something about with mental compulsions, is ACT better? Yeah, well, it's more effective for pure O. So I just took that as uh, more effective for um, the, the themes of OCD that don't have physical compulsions. And I think they may be saying that from a... Uh, from a um, in ACT, it gets you, as you said, to no notice the thoughts, mindfulness to start to diffuse from them, see them as separate from yourselves, allow them to go past. And maybe that's where they're seeing the usefulness with the mental compulsion. Um, mm -hmm. But we know ERP works for mental compulsions. The thing is, I think what it what they might also be getting at is that mindfulness idea, right? Mm -hmm. Mindfulness is fabulous for so many things. And many great folks in this field will say it's a great adjunct um, to doing ERP because with being, we can get better at, calming our brains to just be present and notice without judgment. We're in a much better place. Now, when you notice a mental, so you have a fear thought, and then there's the mental compulsion is I want to undo it. I want to say something. I want to review to see, did that really happen? It, all these subtle, sometimes mental compulsions, we have to use a lot of intent and a lot of courage to choose not to engage in those behaviors. So I find that if we're looking for a simple way out and ACT, I think if you're doing it correctly, isn't. <laughs> but I think some people like to look at mindfulness or ACT if I just notice my thoughts and see what they are, diffuse from them. It's kind of like the old days, like, oh, that's my OCD. That's just my OCD. I see what my thoughts are doing. Um, it would be great if we could just move on and go towards our valued living. But my experience, over, and I've heard other people on here talk, OCD is tapping into the amygdala. It's, it's threatening the brain in such a huge way that to just keep moving on towards your values, and you've got this screaming monster coming at you, and you're just going to keep noticing the screaming monster, and you're going to keep going, okay, we're going in the right direction. But like I've asked some of my folks, let's just experiment with that. And... Not once has that really gotten people where they need to go. It's like we have to do that extra step. We actually have to go toward the fear, not just notice it and this too shall pass and I can sit with it and keep going. That would be great. Like so many thoughts that work so well with 
noticing thoughts that cross our minds, uncomfortable feelings, and we can be with those and keep taking valued actions. Fabulous model. But with the OCD brain, I worry sometimes, not worry, but I become concerned sometimes that this becomes a subtle avoidance. I don't have to really lean into my fear. I don't have to really accept uncertainty. I'm just going to leave it at this. And so I found with folks, great, notice, be aware. We can diffuse from that, see it. Now what are we going to do with it that's in line with taking your committed actions and leaning in and accepting uncertainty and saying, I'm willing to take on all that uncertainty and embrace it. It's more intentional. It's more proactive because I want to live my valued life. That extra piece that comes with ERP, I haven't seen anyone be able to successfully avoid doing that and have the outcome they want. So I would encourage someone, you know, using, and that's why I think depending on who's describing how they're using ACT, I might say, well, no, not just notice, and then we can move on with our valued actions and tolerate the discomfort, but we got to actually go toward what's the fear and the uncertainty, because that's really the opposite of engaging in some type of subtle reassurance seeking or whatnot. You know, and others that I've learned from an act would probably say what I learned from them, you know, that part of it is going toward the ERP because that's the committed action that's going to take you to your valued actions, you know. So my advice to someone is try not to skip that step. Hmm. It might be a softer, easier, oh, I can do that. But if we're not really going toward the anxiety, the fear, the discomfort, the what ifs, because we've got to tra- got to get the brain to get that new learning that I can tolerate and I can cope. So we got to go towards what is it we're trying to tolerate and respond to differently. That seems to, I think, take people the distance. That's my experience. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing. And uh, I completely agree. I think they work in harmony perfectly. Um, and I know people like John Abramowitz is doing a lot of research um, with Michael Tuheg, that guy I mentioned, uh, into merging ACT and ERP, how to successfully do it. Because as you said, they accompany each other so well. Um, and it, and uh, John Abraham, it always talks about you absolutely still need ERP, but ACT kind of supercharges it a bit. Um, yeah, I like that. Yeah. ACT supercharges it. it gives, for me, it gives me some of the pieces that help me individualize this to build motivation, mm. um, the willingness and some other skills, the mindfulness, the awareness, building motivation, willingness to go towards something really, really uncomfortable for greater reason, goals and values. It kind of adds all that, um, kind of it just encapsulates what puts the whole package together, yeah. which I think, you know, ERP alone used to be seen as, oh my God, <laughs> people come, okay, now what exposure do we do? And I keep doing these, how many times till I get to a lower number? And yeah, oftentimes the motivation was just, I want to feel better. Mm-hmm. You know, when we can see the greater good to what we're doing and have some strategies that help us see this in the bigger picture of our life, yay. And that's yeah. why I think it has helped tremendously. I think my patients these days, when, when they're on with their values and their committed action, because that's what they really want, they run with it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah absolutely. Um, I will caveat one thing, because I know my audience. Um, <laughs> many of them will now be thinking, right, I need, I need a CBT therapist who will not only do ERP, but will merge ACT with it as well. And that not every CBT therapist believes in ACT or, or has, has done extra training in ACT. So don't stress out if you can't find someone who uses both. If you just get someone who understands OCD and uses ERP, you'll be absolutely fine um, because absolutely. it's very successful. Yes. And you can have a lot of, I know what you mean about the political part, a lot of people agreeing and disagreeing all over the place about ACT for various reasons. But a therapist who provides really good ERP uh, is what you really need. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them, probably maybe myself included, you know, wouldn't you know, say, oh, I'm an ACT therapist. Um, but most of us, many of us kind of question like, huh? Like, didn't we kind of do this in the early days? <laughs> you know, the whole idea of building awareness and how do we stay more aware and step back from noticing our thoughts? Well, now they've got a term, detached mindfulness. And mindfulness was not a term when I was first starting out. It was kind of a meditative awareness. And then, you know, really spending time on motivational interviewing. Uh, and we just use different terms. 
Um, but a good ERP therapist is always going to be thinking in terms of what are your goals and why do you want to get there? Why is it worth it? That's all. Yeah. So yeah, you don't need to have a, you know, an act informed <laughs> ERP therapist. ERP is the gold standard. Act. A lot of the components within ACT, and of course people may disagree with me, but 30 years ago, learning all this stuff, we call some of these things different things, and it wasn't consolidated into such a nice um, you know, treatment package. But building awareness, gradually building awareness, your motivation for why you're doing that, you know, it, ERP therapists do that too. Yeah. Maybe different words. Yeah, no, yeah, I get it. Um, okay, cool. Thank you for answering that. Um, and I think it's an important question to, to raise. Uh, so thank you yeah. to the listener. Um, okay, so interesting one. And, and it's kind of a theme-based question, but I'll ask it anyway because it's not one I've come across before on this, on this podcast at least, which is what would be a good exposure to do for someone that suffers from cheating theme of OCD? So i.e. someone who worries that they're going to cheat. Right. So... Again, this is where the creativity comes in. Oh, well, one thing I, I want to carry out, I, I assume they mean cheat within a relationship, not cheat on a test or anything like that. Yeah, that's right. Relationship yeah. OCD, right. So relationship OCD is all the doubts, confusions, like how do I know for sure? How do I know for sure? Like, so that can take many. Well, how do I know for sure I'll cheat or not cheat on this person? How do I know for sure I am cheating or not cheating on this person? How do I know for sure? Sometimes it can take the form this is the right person for me. How do I know for sure? You know, it's like the uncertainty is the problem. Um, I heard somebody on one of these podcasts say, just spend three months as if this is the person for you and see how that, see how that feels if you eliminate all the compulsions. And you know. um, So their fear is, the core fear is, I will cheat on my spouse. And so the real, in OCD, it's not a logic, yes or no, will I or will I, won't I rather, where, you know, where's the evidence? It's the brain is just triggered with this intense anxiety and fear and almost a life-threatening way. I might cheat, and that's so against their values. And so what people usually do is they're trying to check for reassurance that they're not cheating or that they're not going to cheat, and then that feeds the whole thing. So, okay, so then we would try to lean into maybe it's possible I don't know. I could cheat, right? That's where we'd want to go. The uncertainty. Instead of giving ourselves certainty, we have to be willing to go towards the acceptance of the I don't knows, the uncertainties. I might never know for sure if I'll cheat someday. You and I don't know for sure if we would ever cheat someday, right? Nobody does. Um, but in the OCD brain, that if that's the uh, thought that gets really activated, and person wants that urgency and they have to have that settled because those are your values, then we go toward, I don't know. I may never know. I might have to live my whole life never knowing if I'll cheat. I mean, often when we do imaginal exposures, I think Shala talked about this, are we going for worst case scenario or are we going for the uncertainty ones? Usually the uncertainty ones are where we're getting more. Um, it's like, well, okay, I can kind of get used to that awful image and I don't feel horrible now. But uncertainty I'll have to live with never knowing for sure if it's possible that I could cheat on my spouse just like people with pedophiles I have to live with the uncertainty that I might never know for sure if I could be a pedophile or do something to a child or and then his therapist would right I don't know I can never know for sure mm. you can never know for sure you can never know for sure but your brain is so highly charged by this so what do we need to do we need to go towards the acceptance the uncertainty and practice tolerating that and not engage in all the compulsions or maneuvers as subtle as they might be, um, you know, to rein those in because that's the opposite of accepting the uncertainty. So that could be all sorts of things that you would individualize with that person. Like I've worked with people who are like, well, but if I go to the gym and there's like all those beautiful women, so they try not to look at the beautiful women. No, we're going to go look at the beautiful women, right? So. And you're like, is that cheating? I don't know. You know, just looking at the really beautiful. Because a lot of times one of the compulsions is to kind of heads down, oh, God, can't make eye contact with another woman. So we're going to look heads up 
maybe these are just ideas. Yeah. I don't know. Whatever would be best for that person. If they're trying not to make eye contact with really good looking man or woman or whatnot, or look at people at the gym or look at pictures um, in some of these magazines where people are really attractive and not in many clothes or um, if they're trying to avoid having conversations with someone of the opposite sex or same sex, depending on um, what's triggering for them, we want to go toward those things. So we would look for ways to practice. Maybe that maybe I'm cheating. Maybe if I have a conversation with this group of people at the gym and they're all so attractive and I kind of like hanging out with them, we're not going to avoid them. We're going to go toward that. Maybe that means I'm cheating. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe that means okay. So we're going to look for whatever people are avoiding or trying to use some form of compulsion or reassurance around and challenge that to embrace uh, the fear. Maybe. We've got to be more comfortable in the land of maybes. And my three magic words, I don't know. I may never know. So we do things. Intentionally look for ways to trigger that, to bring it on. So the brain can get new learning with not trying to get out from under it. But I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, really, really good answer. And that I may never know is uh, one of the hardest questions to, right. to accept. And I may never know is really the core of it. Yeah. Because after uncertainty means we may never know. And ugh, that's the scary thing. And that's what we got to try to go toward. And what does that mean about me if I am a... We all have, you know, some psychoeducation. We all have thoughts, and none of these thoughts is different than what anybody else could have. But your brain is getting so activated by that, and it's not thinking clearly. It's not about rationally whether or not you would. The threat response, and the whole amygdala, and the firing, and the adrenaline. And so, what we do is we have to challenge that by going toward it, and it's really uncomfortable. Yes, yeah. but what's the, the question I ask all the time, and people, I don't know, what's the alternative? Keep trying to avoid all these people at this gym. Keep trying to avoid eye contact with someone you think might be attract. Is this how you want to live your life? You know, and that's usually where we get the, the motivation. But the individual ways of practicing really depend on the individual. Yeah. So I feel a little funny, you know, giving any particular advice to someone who I've never met. I don't know what their form of cheating OCD really looks like or how does that get played out in terms of their compulsions. But that's what the therapist would be working with them to figure out what's the fear, what's it activating, what are we leaning into accepting, I don't know, I don't know if I'll ever eat, I don't know, I don't know if I could ever kill my child, right, it's hard stuff, and how do we go toward that and change all those compulsions and avoidances, and be, you know, go for it, as Reed Wilson or Shala would say, bring it on, yeah. bring it on, not just like, oh, I'm going to see if I can take a look, let's bring it on, let's bring it on. Then you've got a whole new relationship with those thoughts. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I really like that. And uh, for me, that's where values comes back in. Again, here, it's kind of, I don't know if I'll ever cheat or not cheat. But what I do know is right now I want to live by my values. And, does, and what that means in the relationship, does that mean I take my wife out to the cinema because she wanted to see that film? Does it mean I hoover because I've put it off for a day or two and I know it will please her? You know, do I ask her about her day? Like those things. Not as compulsions, but because yep. they align with what I want to be within this relationship. Yeah, I think that that's the quick and dirty answer. <laughs> like, you know, I found that that's the answer. Um, when I've been interviewing some people for a group that I'm doing right now that has self-compassion and OCD, the, so they haven't been my, my patients. But the ones that just impress the heck out of me is at choice points, they're choosing their life's values. Like, I want to take my wife to the cinema. I want to be present and enjoy this time I have in life with my wife and she wants to go to the cinema. <gasps> This means I'm going to face seeing all these people and having all these things triggered and, you know, and I'm going to want to try to handle it. I'm willing to go toward facing those uncertainties and I don't know and not try to reassure myself that I'm not cheating or I'm going to have to look at people like we're not going to avoid them. We're going to look at you and I'm taking my wife to the cinema because that's so yeah. much more important to me. Like I've worked with some folks like so which is your greater value? what you just told me about your baby, your life, your family, how you live in the world. 
or feeling certain. Because really, achieving certainty becomes its own value. OCD brain, OCD brain hijacks it like that's your value. That's more important than anything. And it's like, is finding certainty your value? Or are these really your values? So we got to live with uncertainty, the, the uncertainty monsters, and live truly to your values. And if you make those choices over and over, it seems like it, it is easier for people to go toward facing those fears and those I don't knows. Yeah. It's so much more important. Yeah, my wife is so much more important to me. Here we go. I'm doing it. Yeah, yes. really, really good point. I, yeah, I never looked at it like that before. Um, okay, so this next question is a, is a good one. Uh, I think I know how you are, uh, your answer is, um, which is, what do I do if an obsession I have done a lot of ERP with comes back? Well, yeah. I'm learning more and more to talk like Shala and Reed Wilson <laughs> and just say, invite it in. Hmm. Right? That's what they would say. They use that humor. Um and irreverent sometimes, but that it really is it. Invite it in. Hello. Hello, old thought. Hello, old obsession. Welcome back. Mm. Right? Because the way this works, the way the OCD brain works, and that was something I wrote about, is it's not like I practice all these things on my hierarchy and then I never have to worry about those coming back again. And then the, you know, whack-a-mole game, but now another one pops up. And if I work on all those, I'll never have to worry about those again. Because it's really not about the content. It's about the brain getting triggered whenever it gets triggered by something that taps into your, your core fears. So it's very common for old obsessions to pop up at any time, anywhere, and for new ones to pop up. And it's like good news, bad news. People go, oh, man, you kidding me? But it's a lifelong practice because until we have the, I don't know, we might someday have the magic answer that makes all of this, like the brain not do this. But for now, it is a lifelong practice. So whether an old obsession or a new obsession comes up, it's like, okay, hey, come on in. Welcome it in because we're going to work with it the same way we always work with it now, with our new skills and strategies of accepting, leaning into the uncertainty and doubt and changing the response and helping the brain get that new learning um, and change, you know, they talk about changing the expectancies. Oh, no, that thought comes up and, oh, my God, I can't, this is going to, no. We're just going to do the practice again. So it's very common for old obsessions to pop up. And I try to tell people all the time in workshops I do, it's in my book, you know, please try to remember this is not a failure. This is just typical. You know, it's pretty, it's, I don't think it's, it's probably more not typical. <laughs> Something never comes back up again. It's typical for an old obsession to pop up for whatever reason, what you were doing there, it came into your brain. You know, it popped into your brain. And you're like, no, go away, thought. I don't want to have that thought. Embrace it. Oh, there you are again. I know you. Hmm. Or it could be a, a brand new one. Say, oh, you're, that's interesting, brain. You gave me a whole interesting twist on that one. I didn't expect that one to come up. But they're all just content. And we're still working on the same process. So in, you know, Daring to Challenge OCD, Ted's the best example of that. You know, and he would... He was a priest, and then he had all these scrupulosity um, obsessions, and did he do everything just right, just so? He's going to be responsible, or else people will, you know, burn in hell if he doesn't do things right. Then he leaves the church, and he goes, I don't even believe in those kind of rules anymore. And he gets married to a woman, and he's worried about ant poisoning and hitting people with his car, and his glass police, and am I being responsible enough about this or this? And then um, he said, can you believe it? I'm in my 80s, and the pedophile one got me. I never thought that one would get me. Now that one's, it takes all these different forms. And he said, so it was what, 50 years ago that the obsession about getting the baptismal water on the baby's forehead, did it really land on the baby's forehead or not? And he had so much uncertainty and doubt about that. And he was terrified that he's going to be responsible for what happens to this baby and all. And he's 50 years later, he's in his eighties. He goes, can you believe that obsession just popped into my head and it really scared me? He goes, I don't even believe in heaven and hell. <laughs> and he's I don't believe any the what I you know, that's not who I am now. But that obsession scared me and it <clears throat> gave that rise just as much as it did way back then when I was really caught in the belief. And he's like, but and he's got this great humor about it now. He goes, I learned what I need to do. I do my ERP and I accept uncertainty. So he went right at the accepting uncertainty about 
that fear. And that's common. And it comes up with so many of the folks I work with. They're like, Joan, this one's back. I'm failing. I'm like, no, 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 that's normal. Okay, that one is at least familiar. How are we going to work with that one? You know, or sometimes people will come back years later. This obsession popped up again. Great, let's work with it. You're going to keep working with it the same way. Or they'll come back and say, okay, something's wrong because this is different. Like, that's what the OCD brain does. It finds a different obsession now. So old obsessions, new obsessions, it's just your brain latching on to something that frightens you, um, something about something you value, and that overfiring in the brain, that, you know, anxiety response that gets overly triggered. There it is. But that's okay. You know, I say that's okay. We know what to do with that one. So what do you do? You invite it in and work with it the way you always would work with an obsession. Yeah, good point. And I like that story. Um, yeah, that, that's a big one for me, actually. When, some, when something comes up in my brain that starts to make me anxious, that made me anxious, say, several years ago, and it's not something I'd thought about for a while, right. it, it catches me out. But then eventually I, I see through it and I'm like, well, why hasn't this been bothering me for the entirety of the last three years? Like, why was I completely at peace with it? And then that's a real indicator of, hang on a minute, this is OCD. Yeah, yeah. right. Because it really is this tricky creature. Yeah. Um, of how our brains work, what thoughts pop into our minds for whatever reason at whatever time, mm -hmm. an old one or a new one or it didn't bother us for a while or you think this is the biggest one. And one of the greatest examples of just how the brain works and responding to OCD differently where it does get easier, and I might have told this last time, I don't know, was Mary, yeah. who you did, you did a podcast with. And she wasn't one of my patients, but she told her story in the book. And she's, you know, in recovery. She does so well. She goes out speaking on this. She joins me at workshops. You know, she's like Charlotte. She's got it. And then um, she's a playwright and an actress. And I was going to see one of her plays. And I went to the play. It was fabulous. At the end of the night, I was backstage. Congratulations. She goes, come here, come here, come here. And I said, yeah. She goes, I have to tell you this story. I said, what? And she said, I woke up this morning and had the most horrific obsession i thought this is the one this one's gonna get me this is i've never had this i don't know how to do you know, this is the one after all the work she's done and how people think she's doing so well i said oh my goodness she goes but i thought about i'm gonna see you tonight after the show so that's good I said, okay great did you want to tell me about it and then she said you know what's so funny she says i can't remember what it was <laughs> and she said because she's like so good at knowing like whatever the fear is if I'm going to, like, like Shala, if I'm going to stay on top of this OCD thing, I've got to embrace it. I've got to bring it on. I've got to go for it and bring it on. You know, she has that attitude like Shala has. And so that she just did her like practicing with it and ch not engaging in compulsions and taking it in to the point where by the time she got focused on her play and doing the play, it wasn't there anymore. So old ones come back for her, a brand new one that scared the heck out of her. But she practiced her old, you know, the, the same strategies will, will keep helping you. And where do these thoughts come from? They just grab something that's of value to you or pops up in your mind again. You're like, oh, no, not that again. It's okay. It's just another one to work with. Yeah. Yeah, really, really good story. Um, okay, so last of the listener questions here, uh, which is, and, and I guess you have answered this, but specifically for this one is, is it better to try and reduce responses gradually or try and stop them all at once? Uh, after all, it's been, it's going to be painful anyway. So why is it any more painful doing it, um, doing it in one, at one time? Or is it just dragging out the process if it is done slowly or gradually? And does the same apply for a non-OCD person enabling the OCD sufferer, e.g., should I stop helping my daughter with her decontaminating rituals all at once or reduce them gradually? Okay, that's a two-parter. <laughs> a twofer. Um, I would like to think that what I find most helpful is the goal is to increase the likelihood of success in doing this work. Now, we have plenty of studies. We know that the more intensely, you know, more intensive treatment will really help. 
Um, and like they've got these studies now coming out of um, is it is it Norway or Sweden? Oh, um, um, the Bergen yes. method. Yeah. The Bergen method, right? Four days. <laughs> Pull in seven in the morning to nine at night with your therapist doing things from the menu and you're all in and they've got really high rates of effectiveness. And we also know from the intensive treatment programs and I've heard people talk in the podcast, they made the greatest gains when they had to just throw themselves into the intensive treatment because if you space out exposure practices, it, it doesn't work as well, but the more you can, do them so you really I heard Shala talk about this you're really trying to keep reinforcing that new learning if you wait too long and then you're kind of starting again with what am I trying to remember and how am I doing this it can drag the process on and as therapists with more individual practices we have to look out for that because if people want to take it just so carefully or so gradually at a pace that works for them we can be willing to experiment with that and caution people though about going too slowly because what we see is people get demoralized, it's still dragging on, they're not fully engaged, they're not totally with the program, they're still try they're trying to keep it at, at hand's length. And the whole idea of changing things up on the hierarchy now and not necessarily following a perfect hierarchy I think is fabulous because life throws you stuff all over the place. You can't say, hey, I'm at a 30 or 40 on my hierarchy. These things that are coming at me all day are 80, 70, nope, nope, nope. You know, we want to be able to just across situations, across different um, levels of anxiety, really keep going for it as much as possible. So I think what we're always trying to find is that balance of what works for you, what can you do, what are you willing to do, what are you able to do in your life right now? Because the more we go for it, the better this will be. But if it's way too overwhelming for someone, and I heard one great person who used to teach a lot about this. He says, you sometimes you just start with a couple of experiments. And when people get a couple of exposures under their belt, they get how this works. We'll go slowly at first, but then now you're ready to go for it. You know, once they see how it works, they might be in a better position to commit to do this more intensively. So I think our goal is to make sure we're maximizing the likelihood of people practicing as regularly as possible to get success out of this treatment. And so, yeah, Often, if the, the more you can go for it all uh, with help and guidance on how to best do that, great. But many people's lives, you know, it's difficult to say, I'm going to take time off from work and do an intensive program for three or four weeks or two weeks to go to this hospital setting here or a day treatment program there. And sometimes I've got people working with a day program for quite a few hours and they do that for a few weeks. And then they come back to me and we're trying to figure out how we can do a few times a week. We're trying to maximize the likelihood of successful exposures and practices. So we try to do what's realistic, but not push somebody. If it's too far, too fast, and they're just not ready, they're not really on board, hmm. they'll drop out uh, the other side. If we go too slowly, like, well, I'm willing to dabble in this. We're not really willing. We're not really committed. Steve Hayes does some great videos on that, hmm. trying to get somebody to do an exposure. <laughs> and he's looking at the first, he goes, you're not really willing. The guy says, yes, I am. And Steve's like, no, you're not. How willing are you? And he goes, 50%. He goes, nope, not good enough. You know. So he worked with him for like a 20-minute 20, 20 period to get him 100% on board because he had a greater life's values and he was really, really, when he was willing to go for it, he would really go for it. So we're trying to find that balance. And you know, the more you can go for it quickly, keep working it, the better. The more you drag it on or space it out, it's probably not going to be as helpful. But we're trying to find the balance that helps you build the momentum. Usually people, once the, I, they're telling me all the things they're practicing in the week and we got a momentum going, like we're golden. If I'm trying to really say, no, come on, did you practice this week? Maybe we need something more intensive to get people going. Yeah. So, yeah, better to do more than less. But find a, if you haven't also worked on how can I arrange my life, like you've got children and you're trying to bring them places and you've got a job, you've got 101 demands on you. How realistic is it to do more intensive work? Well, we could step back and work with your spouse and work with your employer and figure out who's going to help take care of the kids so that you could really do a more intensive um, program. So we got a lot of things to figure out before just jumping into that because we want a successful exposure practice. Now that next question, 
is the person in the life of someone with OCD. Now, in that case, I don't know how old the child, if it's a child or if it's an adult. Child, I believe. Yeah, so I'm, I'm out of my territory here because I'm not working with children these days in OCD. But that's where parents would be involved in setting up the plan together with their therapist and maybe depending on the age of the child, the child. So it's all a plan. Because mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, if you've got the child thinking I'm doing well and going at one pace and they got the parent just throwing all these new things, I'm not going to let you do it, I'm not going to... You're probably going to have this poor child going, oh, you know, overwhelmed. Um, and then, like what I see with adults, if the spouse says, okay, I learned, I'm not supposed to give reassurance, I got it. And then they're shifting completely from how they've been. Then the other spouse is like, do you love me? Where are you? I need some comfort. I need, no, I give no reassurance. You know, that's not going to be so helpful. Ideally, what we're trying to do when I'm working with adults or even young adults with parents and adults with spouses or, you know, boyfriends, girlfriends, is let's all talk about this together. So we're in the treatment plan together. And I think Jonathan Abramowitz does a lot of that. He's bringing the couple in. It's a couple's treatment. Mm -hmm. So that we're working on what are the changes that this the person who's the identified patient is making and what role is their significant other or loved one, family member going to play and have an agreement on what that's going to look like. Otherwise you're going to have fights at home. <laughs> you know, where one person says, well, I thought I was supposed to never reinforce it. No, my understanding is you don't do this or this, but right now I still need your help with this so that we have a plan that everyone's in agreement on. And often it involves for me, helping the spouse say, I'm not going to answer that question until you tell me what you really want me to do. It sounds like the question you're asking is reassurance seeking. And that's what we talked to Joan about. So you're really upset and you want me to give you reassurance. Now we talked about Joan saying, and we agree that that's just feeding into your OCD. So really please think this through. What, you're, what do you really want me to do here? <laughs> you know, then it's on the person to say, oh, right. Okay, thank you. For my, and then they can give lots of love and support. For, you did it. You're writing stuff out. This is great. But rather than just like throwing things on top of a person and they're not expecting it, like as a therapist, we wouldn't do that. And say, oh, by the way, you have to open that door right now. And they're like, what? I'm not ready for that. You never spring it on them. That's not fair. It's their treatment. And they want it to be a collaborative, agreed upon, step by step plan of when does the spouse make changes often first. Well, if I don't have OCD, I don't have to take my clothes off before I walk in the house or put my shoes in a certain place. And we're all going to agree. That's going to be hard. That's a great first step. And then maybe the spouse is going to pull back on reassurance seeking in certain ways. But then the patient is involved in that too. So it's all working well together. You know, if a patient came into my office and I just started throwing things at them that I thought would be really scary, that's you know, it's just kind of mean. They're not involved. They weren't ready for that. We want to make sure that they're ready to do some things, too. So with children, again, this is not the area I work in. I'm not working with children these days. But I would imagine a lot of it would be the same. You don't kind of want to just surprise. Haha, we're, we're not going to do this for you. We're going to withhold. And the child's not knowing why or what's going on. Mm -hmm. I would imagine really good ERP therapists, I think a lot of my clinicians, clinician friends work with children. And I think I heard Shala talk about this. They set up all sorts of great reward systems, point systems to help their child refrain from compulsions and they can earn these points. And like you'd probably want to work in a system, a systematic way that helps the parent know the pace the child is going at and the therapist is guiding them um, in how to keep rewarding and reinforcing that pace. Because mm -hmm. it'd be hard to a person in treatment going at one level and then the outsider coming in at a whole different level that might not match, might not be very helpful. Yeah, good points. And uh, thank you for addressing both of those. Um, before we get on to uh, two of my sort of silly questions at the end, uh, is there anything else you wanted to say on just ERP generally or anything you want to share? Thank you. Yeah, the this, what I'm spending a lot of time on these days is that idea that at this stage in my game, I'm learning more from people who really have worked with OCD. They, they have OCD. 
and they're in the recovery process and how did they apply strategies to really succeed at doing this work and to continue to succeed at doing this work. So people like Shala and a lot of the podcasts I listen to of yours, I'm like, cool, there's another great idea. There's another great idea. And so I'm using a lot of just creative ways to help people externalize those fear thoughts, their OCD. Like Shala has, um, I know nobody can see what I'm holding here, but Shala has one of these kind of little balls that's orange and she gave it feet and sunglasses and little knitting needles. And she talks to her OCD. She talks back and forth to it. And then she'll do things that will upset the OCD because she's trying to torture the OCD. She's trying to win those. And she pictures the OCD guy going, blah, and he falls over like, no, type of thing. So in my, and then I listened to one of your um, podcasts, I think just recently with Sean. Uh, Shinnick. Yeah. So I was really interested in um, the parallel with the gremlins because I talk about the OCD gremlin all the time to try to externalize what the OCD gremlin is trying to do to you. And interestingly, it was for me in Boston in the early 80s. I was in a program. You just joined up for Harvard Community Health as a health program. And they asked, they encouraged people to take a stress management class preventative medicine wonderful class they taught us meditation they didn't have the term mindfulness yet in the early 80s there um body scans relaxation calming and they also taught us to sit and draw our gremlin Mm. and our gremlin could be they didn't make it specific to ocd it could be worry thoughts scary thoughts panicky thoughts the thoughts that come at you and to scare you So we now could apply that to OCD, panic, social anxiety. And they gave us all a book called Taming Your Gremlin. And the idea was you draw your gremlin and make him as ugly as you want. They give you all these things to draw with. And then what you do in the work is you start to become friends with your gremlin. Like we're embracing the OCD thoughts. We're embracing the uncertainty. We're working with the gremlin. And then the gremlin might be kind of not so pretty, but he then becomes like a little like, you know, character who's harmless and almost cute, right? And so then we carry our gremlin around with us and we're not going to feed the big scary gremlin. We're going to just make friends with and be with that gremlin idea. And it's a lot of what Shala does, I think, with her imagery of her OCD monster. And so I've got um, I've got all these gremlin, I've got gremlins all around my office. And my favorite one, only you can see, but where's the camera part? You know, so we talk, kind of like the two-chair technique. We're talking about gremlin to gremlin and what the gremlin's saying and talking back to that gremlin. And then he starts to get kind of cute and funny and just using whatever's creative for that person. They might draw something that's really good for them. I have quite a few people walking around with these little gremlin fingertip things and they can pull it out of their pocket. Oh, that's what you're trying to tell me. Well, take that, you know, kind of like Shala does or, you know, this kind of, the imagery of something she actually created. And I think finding your own creative imagery, stories, metaphors, that's what I'm writing about these days and presenting on these days, are so helpful. Like for an example was when Shala came, and I might have talked about this before, when she came to give a talk out here in Oakland and she stayed at my house. And when she was putting the cream cheese on the bagel, it got away from her, the whole thing. And it flipped upside down, so it landed with the cream cheese on the floor. My kitchen floor at the line between the dining and the kitchen. So it's kind of like that crack. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't there. I was um, in another room. And she goes, you won't believe what happened to me. And I'm like, what happened? And she goes, you'll hear. So she told the story at the workshop. And she said, and everybody's going, ooh. So I picked up the bagel. And, you know, it had landed on that crack and everything. I'm thinking to myself, oh, my gosh, how dirty is my kitchen floor? How bad was it? (laughs) And and Shala says, I ate the bagel with the cream cheese. And everybody went, what? And somebody in the group said, but wait a minute. I tried to judge when to tackle an OCD challenge and not by what would a normal, quote, person, normal, you know, not OCD person do. She says, I don't think many people would do that. And Shala said, ah, but you know what? I'm not. I got OCD. I have to take on the challenges. I'm going to keep taking on the challenges. And then one of my own folks who had been in that workshop came in the week or two later and with her husband and said, oh, now we say I'm cream cheesing it. I'm cream cheesing it. 
So every time she's up against one of those dilemmas, I'm cream cheesing it. And we know what that means. Mm. It means tell a story, right? So using stories like that, that people can share, following, finding your expressions or your gremlin, um, how you handle those choice points, the buffalo or the cow, and finding what works for you so you don't have a bunch of words. Like, okay, so I'm supposed to lean into the, I don't know, but it's like, okay, what is the, how do I do this? And as Jeff Bell and Shala nicely talk a lot about, you can bring some humor to it. So those obsessions are tough, mm. but and we're going to go toward them. And we can, I mean, I learned from Edna Foer to sing them. I love to sing. I'll either drive people crazy or they'll start singing Broadway musical tunes with me that we make up to lean into their obsessions and their fears. You know, you can sing them, you can draw them, you can caricature them, you can create your monsters, you can carry monsters, with reminders of what you want to keep challenging throughout the day. So I'm thinking a lot about the creativity piece. Yeah. And Shala... You know, I know you've been talking with her about her book, Is Fred in the Refrigerator. She's got so many brilliant ones in there that I just mark them and read to people what some of them are. And I won't take the time here, but the final paragraph hmm. in her her book is, I read to almost every one of my OCD patients, like, this is what we're going for. And it's the idea that her OCD monster is going, Shala, Shala, Shala. <laughs> She's like, yes, OCD, but maybe we're not done with this book yet. Maybe we put all the wrong information in. Maybe we didn't put the most important stories in. Maybe, maybe. And she's like, okay, OCD, I'm used to you now. This is what it's like living with the OCD monster. She says, maybe we didn't. But you know what, little monster? <laughs> you know, I've accepted that you're going to be with me forever. And I've accepted that uncertainty is going to be with both of us forever. And that's okay. And I'm going to teach you how to live in the gray areas, okay? And then the OCD creature goes, oh, okay, Shala. And goes back to its knitting. I just love that. It's like yeah. having the relationship with that OCD monster or gremlin where you start to change your relationship with it. So that's one of my final thoughts about ERP. Is it's, you know, it's hard. It's scary. People are asking questions that are sounding a little bit like, how can I get out from under some of the hard part? But going toward it. You can bring creativity and um, whatever helps you individualize it for you to keep maximizing the likelihood of your success and to learn from people who've done it and all the great ideas they have. Like Sean's idea with the drawing, drawing project with the grandma. I was like, yeah, that's, that sounds great. So that's one of my final, final thoughts about doing this work. Cool. No, thank you. Good way to end. And yeah, I really like that that part of uh, Charlotte's book. Um, yeah. So, a uh, couple of quick questions, which is, if you could pick up the phone and call your 20-year-old self, what would you tell her? Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> Around you had the billboard and everything. <laughs> um, be Be courageous. Be courageous, be brave, be vulnerable. You know, because courage, I mean, I'm really loving Brene Brown's work and it it connects so much with the work I've done on vulnerabilities and how we respond to them. And I think, you know, our younger selves, we feel so vulnerable and so scared. And we, to me, I talked about this in the last podcast, at that time in my life, I had so much uncertainty in bad ways. Um, I'd be like, somehow embrace uncertainty and uh be courageous be vulnerable just show up just keep showing up yeah that's what i like nice. yeah it's mine cool yeah love it uh and now the billboard question you've got ah, a billboard gosh. in san fran what do you want it to say oh i'd have so much more to say i think i'm like i think times have changed since we did our last <laughs> Um, podcast. The last podcast, I said, life may not be the party we hope for, but while we're here, we may as well dance. Mm. And dance and music, like I was hearing in that interview with uh, Sean, dance, music. If people can dance and sing and have music in their lives, they're going to probably do well with helping the world be a better place, in my opinion. Um, so that would still be there. And I guess now I'd probably look for something a little more politically charged um, than back then. <laughs> which might be still about um, be kind, which everybody's writing these days, be kind, 
be courageous, show compassion, and please keep showing up. Something like that. Yeah, I love it. Absolutely. Use that kindness and self-compassion, but just showing up. Yeah. It's a difference versus avoid, you know, I can't handle, I can't cope, and just keep showing up. Woody Allen had a quote, and I'm going to get it wrong, um, because I don't know if it's 90% of success or 80% of success or whatever he said, um, but I think it was 90 Ninety percent of success is just showing up, yeah. and we put in a book that Jackie Persons, Michael Tompkins, and I wrote on depression 20, 30 years ago. We put that as one of the quotations, you know, to just just keep showing up, just keep trying, just keep getting out there, mm-hmm. and have, finding the courage. And sometimes it's a um, compassion comes in courage too, to have the compassion towards ourselves, to have the courage to face what we need to face, but just keep showing up mm-hmm. and not, not avoid, not look for ways to get out from under, in this case with OCD, but I mean, for many things in life, just just show up. Absolutely. All right? Yeah. No, I've heard that quote. It's really good. Uh, another one similar to that is a motivational, American motivational speaker, uh, Eric Thomas. He said, um, get yourself in mer- miracle territory. And he yeah. just means just show up. You know, recovery will seem like a miracle when you're no longer constantly getting beaten by OCD. And right. that's quite literally just, as you say, show up, get yourself where miracles can happen, which is therapy. Yeah. And once you're there, or something happens. Like, um, I think you mentioned in one of these podcasts, like talking to people, hmm. showing up. You know, my thing is speaking in front of large groups of people. Oh. <laughs> it's like, oh, the anxiety. Just show up. Or my husband will call me before one of the talks. He goes, just show up. That's all you got to do. Just be there. Just be there. Don't worry about how well you're going to do. Just show up. And there is something to that. You just keep showing up. Uh, and yeah, I just want to thank you for your time, uh, for, for answering absolutely. the listeners' questions and giving so generously. Oh, absolutely. It's a pleasure. I know I wanted to do this earlier, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to do this with you so earlier. Good. So glad we got it in now. And it's great talking with you, and I love these discussions that you get going. And i um, proud to be a part of them. Thank you, Joan. I appreciate it. So there you have it. Really hope you enjoyed my conversation with Joan. And uh, thank you for asking all those questions. I hope you found them useful. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. Until we speak, take care.